We welcome you here to First Church of Christ in Longmeadow. No matter who you are or where you find yourself today on your life journey, no matter where you are on your faith journey, you're welcome here with us. We celebrate the extravagant welcome of Jesus Christ, who didn't ask people to be sure about him before he taught them and ate with them and healed them. And neither do we. So no matter your economic status, your abilities, how much time you've ever spent in church or never, no matter who you love, you are welcome here with us. Please join us this morning in worship. Good morning and welcome to First Church of Christ in Longmeadow. This Sunday is the third Sunday after Pentecost. I am Associate Pastor Marisa Brown-Ludwig and together here with our Senior Pastor Pam McGrath, I am delighted to welcome you to our worship this morning. Across our social distancing during this quarantine time, we welcome you from wherever you are and however you are seeing us, whether live streaming on Facebook or YouTube or recorded later on LCTV, no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. Today is Father's Day, and so we remember all who have been father to us, parenting and protecting, nurturing and affirming us. We celebrate them and you all who play this role in our lives. This summer, Pam and I are offering a preaching series called Unraveling, Seeking God When Our Plans Fall Apart. We are exploring together how do we press onward when our tightly knit plans unravel into loose threads. In our unraveling, sometimes life surprises us with a new beginning we couldn't have imagined. Our series explores stories of unraveled shame, identity, fear, grief, dreams, expectations. Stories where God meets us in the spiraling, unraveling our plans and us into something new. As we gather today and every time we gather, whether it's physically, virtually, in small groups, or simply together in our memories of one another, we remember that God is with us always, making us one. Our announcements this week, most of our regular Zoom gatherings have been stopped for summer because we have some new things we are doing as we do every summer. And so there will be um, something called unraveling, art, prayer, Bible study, and journaling, a new class that begins for the first time on July 1st, Wednesday at 6.30 p.m. And then it'll meet six times through the end of August. If you'd like the exact dates or if you'd like information on how to join us on Zoom, please reach out to us at office at firstchurchlongmeadow.org. And today, after worship, as always, we'll have our church school.
We're now having two church schools. From 11 to 11.30 are grades K through 2. And from 11.30 to 12 are grades 3 through 5. I hope that you and your children will join us for those. Today and all month of June, we are celebrating Pride Month. Pastor Maurice and I are wearing our rainbow strolls, stoles in honor. And we're also recommending on our Facebook page and our e-blast that comes out that you take a look at different films and books that celebrate the lives of our LBGTQ friends. So reach out and celebrate and learn and love our family members. Today, we are also holding in prayer um, Conis Bay, our partners in Haiti, and we're continuing our Haiti Scholarship Fund Drive. We have worked with Conis Bay for over 30 years. It's a group of thousands of small Protestant churches, often the poorest in all 10 departments of Haiti. Churches, schools, orphanages, Conis Bay believes that education programs are the key to self-help and economic, spiritual, and social progress for Haiti's poor. They provide primary and secondary schooling for hundreds of children, kindergarten through grade 13. In a country where so many children have no access to education, school is the hope of their families. Please give to the Haiti Scholarship Fund Drive it's a way for you from your homes to change the world. And now if you're joining us live on either Facebook or YouTube, go ahead and begin to send us in your prayer requests. But please remember, this is a public forum. We just need first names. God knows them and knows their needs. And now we turn our hearts to worship. Today we will hear the story of Rispa, whose sons were sacrificed by King David, thinking to appease God for the famine of their time. But she knew that God does not ask for sacrifice. She put her body to protect them and cried out for righteousness until King David heard her cries and understood. The famine was caused by humans, not God. And it was justice that restored the bounty of the land. What work must we do now to end the suffering and famine of our own time? Can we hear the cries of God to make things right? And maybe they are our own cries. Let's enter now into worship. So we invite you to stand up and to sing, to maybe call out. Make sure your neighbors can hear you. This is our song of praise. Please join us. Hear our prayer, O God. Hear our prayer, O God. Hear our prayer, O God. Incline your ear to us and grant your peace. Hear our prayer, O God. Hear our prayer, O God. Incline your ear to us and grant us your Would you please join me in prayer? O oh God of unending surprises, this life is a tapestry of moments woven together, and we long to be weavers of love. Today we gather and we pray that you would unravel our bias, unravel our assumptions, unravel whatever it is that keeps us from you, O oh God. And as you do, clear space in our hearts for your word. We are listening. We are praying. Amen. Our scripture reading today is 2 Samuel chapter 3, verses 7, chapter 21, verses 1 through 14. Rizpah mourns her sons. Now Saul had a concubine whose name was Rizpah, daughter of Aya. There was a famine in the days of David for three years, year after year, and David inquired of the Lord. The Lord said, There is blood guilt on Saul and on his house. 
because he put the Gibeonites to death. So the king called the Gibeonites and spoke to them. Now the Gibeonites were not of the people of Israel, but of the remnant of the Amorites. Although the people of Israel had sworn to spare them, Saul had tried to wipe them out in his zeal for the people of Israel and Judah. David said to the Gibeonites, What shall I do for you? How shall I make expiation, that you may bless the heritage of the Lord? The Gibeonites said to him, It's not a matter of silver or gold between us and Saul or his house, neither is it for us to put anyone to death in Israel. He said, What do you say that I should do for you? They said to the king, the man who consumed us and planned to destroy us so that we should have no place in all of the territory of Israel. Let seven of his sons be handed over to us, and we will impale them before the Lord at Gibeon on the mountain of the Lord. The king said, I will hand them over. But the king spared Mephibosheth, the son of Saul's son Jonathan, because of the oath of the Lord that was between them, between David and Jonathan, son of Saul. The king took the two sons of Rizpah, daughter of Aya, whom she bore to Saul, Armoni and Mephibosheth, and the five sons of Merab, daughter of Saul, whom she bore to Adriel, son of Barzillai, the Mahalathite. He gave them into the hands of the Gibeonites, and they impaled them on the mountain before the Lord. The seven of them perished together. They were put to death in the first days of the harvest, at the beginning of barley harvest. Then Rizpah, the daughter of Aya, took sackcloth and spread it on a rock for herself from the beginning of the harvest until rain fell on them from the heavens. She did not allow the birds of the air to come on the bodies by day or the wild animals by night. When David was told what Rizpah, daughter of Aya, the concubine of Saul, had done, David went and took the bones of Saul and the bones of his son Jonathan from the people of Jabesh Gilead, who had stolen them from the public square of Beth Shan where the Philistines had hung them up on the day the Philistines killed Saul on Gilboa. He brought up from there the bones of Saul and the bones of his son Jonathan, and they gathered the bones of those who had been impaled. They buried the bones of Saul and of his son Jonathan in the land of Benjamin and Zillah, in the tomb of his father Kish. They did all that the king commanded. After that, God heeded supplications for the land. Here ends the reading, and may thanks be to God. So this is a shocking, horrible story, and it's one we don't read much in church. The story of Rizpah is one of many in the Hebrew scriptures that brings to light terrible violence and suffering done to people with less power. Sometimes it's the Israelite people, often it's women and children or non-Israelite tribes. And often the stories are done by people who are named beloved by God, like King Saul and King David. And some of us read them and think they describe a violent, vengeful God, a God who justifies violence and killing against those who are different from God's chosen people. Clearly, King David thinks this, and the story says that the famine persisted because the people were cursed by violence between tribes. So David seeks to make amends, and a violent, vengeful solution is asked for by the neighboring peoples, and he goes and does it. In so doing, he is perpetuating the belief that God wants blood sacrifices, demands suffering and death in repair of sin, that violence and curse are earned by human beings who are sinners. And so more violence is needed to make things right in that understanding. But David is actually heaping injustice upon injustice in this story. The famine doesn't end after the deaths of these seven sons of Saul and two of whom are Rizpahs. David is not getting it right. If the famine does not end, the wrong has not been made right. No, it is Rizpah, the concubine wife of Saul, the powerless one who becomes the agent of change. Rizpah, who was considered a lesser wife, given lesser status. The scripture identifies her as also being raped by one of Saul's nephews, Abner. She probably was taken without choice. And then her children are taken without her choice by David and killed as sacrifice to try and appease God for the wrong that has been done. She is powerless according to the society of her time, invisible 
and her sons are desecrated, treated as dishonored, hateful bodies left on a mountainside to rot as a sign to frighten others. Wilda Gaffney writes that denying a proper burial was a way of punishing an enemy beyond death in ancient times. But Rizba cannot, will not accept that her sons are being thrown away, dehumanized, dishonored, worthless. Invisible or not, powerless or not, she goes up on the mountain and she will not leave them protecting their bodies with hers, fighting off carrion birds and terrible weather to honor them, bringing sackcloth as a sign of piety and sacrifice in protest. Before anyone who has eyes to see, before God, she treats their bodies with love and protection and demands justice for them from spring harvest to the fall rains, it says, probably about six months Six months. The artist who painted the image of Rispa that we saw during the reading of our scripture, Lauren Wright Pittman, writes, God ends the famine when David listens to the voice of this strong, fierce, unraveling woman. When we see injustice, may we, like Rispa, climb the mountain of God and defend those who cannot defend themselves. When we see someone unraveling in inexplicable grief, may this sight unravel us from the ways we are entangled with injustice. So what are the public displays of grief in our time in the wake of appalling injustice like this? On this weekend in which Juneteenth has been recognized, Friday, June 19th, 1865, the day when slavery was officially ended in the United States, it seems especially heart-wrenching and appropriate to hear the voices of black and brown bodies reflected in the story of Rispa. Suffering today, grieving publicly, still not free, demanding justice, even if no one seems to be listening. In 2016, Austin Channing Brown wrote about what was happening for black people that summer, reflecting through the eyes of Rispa, and here's what he said. To my kinfolk, I cannot get the image of Rizpah out of my head. And he was reflecting on the deaths at the hands of police by Philando Castile, Sandra Bland, Eric Garner, and so many more. He said, Rizpah lost a son to state-sanctioned violence. She wouldn't let the violence be forgotten. She wouldn't let it be swept under the rug. She led a protest of one fighting off beasts to bring what measure of dignity for the bodies and indictment for the rulers that was in her power to do. It seems Rispa was alone on that mountain, but you are not. You are not alone. Your body matters. Your life matters. Black lives matter. The terrible violence of the Bible may seem deeply shocking, but it's not worse than the violence of our own time, is it? We may flinch when we hear this biblical description, but it's not worse than what we see on the viral videos of the terrible violence happening now by state-sanctioned people. Now we have more names to add. Ahmed Arbery, Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, Rayshard Brooks, and you have more. We have been seeing how now town hall meetings are on Zoom and press conferences, rallies and prayer vigils, racial justice webinars and panels, protests growing in town after town. Most are peaceful, but with strong, bold demands for systemic change. Some have been gathered to be nonviolent protest, but have ended in riot. So many people say this is a reason not to support what is being demanded, but I want to take a step back here. Now, I have been going to more and more of these programs, and maybe some of you have too. All kinds of public grief and rage, expressions by black and brown neighbors, friends, fellow human beings. And I come from a family that was active in the civil rights movement in the 1960s. And on this Juneteenth weekend, I am galvanized by the systemic racism that continues unabated in our country since the time of emancipation. 
shifting across 400 years from slavery to a failed reconstruction to Jim Crow laws, more than 6,000 mass lynchings that we know of, to mass incarceration, all of black and brown people today, despite great, brave efforts by black Americans to gain equality here. Nowhere is our failure to right this wrong more blatant than in the medical systems we see now where black and brown people are dying disproportionately from coronavirus and being devastated economically, laid off from jobs that can't be worked from home as we quarantine, without prior generations of economic stability to help them out. My dad has been gone 30 years, so active in civil rights he was, but here we are still. If the famine does not end, the wrong that has been is not made right. And I am growing equally galvanized by my own apparent tolerance as a white person for a way of life in our country that is still toxic for people of color, with systems that not only keep them down, but keep taking their lives. It is not an exaggeration to say this. White people like me are famous for saying that civil rights protesters should go slower, be more nonviolent. This is too fast. And maybe like me, some of you have been deeply uncomfortable by some of the demands the protesters are making for more extreme reform or complete deconstruction of police forces and justice systems in our country, for reparations and drastic changes to education, housing, medical, economic, and other systems in our country to get us to a level playing field for people of all colors. But how can we ask for a slower pace and gentler reform of people who have been suffering for 400 years? Not just a little, but with such terror and horrific sacrifice that does not stop. How can it be that a blog like Austin Channing Brown's written in 2016 about RISPA speaks to us today as if nothing has changed? So if I'm uncomfortable with what black and brown voices are demanding now, if I don't like the unrest and upheaval of our time, then I need only confront the text we have read today. If the famine is not ended, the wrong has not been made right. Black colleagues and friends have helped me understand this more. They remind me how in 1966, in an interview with Mike Wallace on CBS, Martin Luther King was confronted with why there were parts of the black movement pushing for violence when he was so specifically nonviolent. And he said, I contend that the cry of black power is at bottom a reaction to the reluctance of white power to make the kind of changes necessary to make justice a reality for the Negro. King said, I think that we've got to see that a riot is the language of the unheard. And he asked us, what is it that America has failed to hear? So if the unrest and the upheaval of our time is making us uncomfortable, we need to ask ourselves, what as a country are we still failing to hear? If RISPA is still on the mountain grieving radically and boldly and desperately, then the kingdom needs to stop making violent sacrifice. It was not God who had to fix it in our story. It was David and the kingdom that had to change. So we as a whole people have to make this right. We must make this right. Now, we may feel overwhelmed by the enormity of the task at hand. I know I do. But we are talking whole systems that are poisoned by racism. The very founding of our country was formed in this way. And we also know that most people are good. And I know that many members of the justice system in our country, judges and lawyers and police, are good people who work hard to protect and defend us fairly. And I believe that they and we are caught in systems of our country that are poisoned systemically. And not only the structures, but also us. So how do we, each individual one of us, answer the call of our faith? The call that Jesus gave us to, to love God and to love our neighbors as ourselves. 
Because really, that's what it comes back to. Well, I believe that no matter how much power or privilege our society gives us or doesn't give us, we have the power to choose in each moment the person we will be. To myself, I say, to more who is given of these privileges and powers, more is required. But we do not all have the same abilities to respond. And though we each can do something, we are going to respond in different ways. So what act is needed from you and me next election, next month, next week, tomorrow, right now, for racial justice to finally come to our country? Where do I need to put my loud words or my silent solidarity, my presence, my body? When I feel despaired about next steps to take, I remember that Jesus did many things to show what God wants from us. He got mad sometimes and he turned over tables in the temple. He called out people in power for doing wrong and demanded justice. And he walked with people and he healed them and he ate with them and he listened to them and he loved them. Surely in this mix, there is something each of us can do. When I feel powerless right now, I remember this story from earlier this month. Zay Jones, who plays football for the, LA, for the LV Raiders, shared a story on his Twitter page about the interaction he had with an elderly woman earlier this month in June. He shared a story saying, I was just at a local home goods store with my cousin getting furniture for my place when an elderly white woman approached me at the checkout counter. She looked at me with tears in her eyes and she said, I'm from Minneapolis and I just want you to know that you matter to me. And he went on to say, I hesitated to hug her because she was wearing a mask from practicing social distancing, but I asked if she wanted a hug and she folded into my arms. She cried while she told me how important it is to spread love. So if you are someone crying out for justice on the mountain, braving time that is too long and violence that breaks your heart, may you hear your voice in the prayer song we will do next. And if you are one who has more privilege and power than the voices crying out, may you hear your voice too. All of us praying together for what we need to bring justice and dignity and wholeness for all of God's children with all of our differences. This next prayer is a combination of song and spoken word. So please don't join Dan and me for the spoken parts. Speak them loud in your room or wherever you are when the words come across your screen. We can do this. We must do this now. How long, oh Lord, will you forget me? How long, oh Lord, will you look the other way? How long, oh Lord, must I wrestle with my thoughts and every day? Have such sorrow in my heart. God, in a world of plenty, how can anyone go without? In a world rich with resources, how can people be impoverished? Lord, we know the answers to these questions. How long, oh Lord, will you forget me? How long, oh And every day have such sorrow in my heart. We know 
because we are complicit in withholding from others all that you have given us to share. We hoard what we have. We keep extra aside for a rainy day. We like to ensure that there will always be enough for us and ours. To the poverty of others, we can change by our choices. Lord, loosen our grasp on all that we have and teach us anew how blessed it is to share. what is right and comfort over justice show us mercy when we numb our pain instead of leaning into empathy unravel us for we long to be changed Lord break down the defenses that we build around our hearts so that when we see your children suffer we cannot help but reach out in love from the abundance you have given us can do this. We must do this. With you, O oh God, all things are possible, even this, trusting you and becoming ourselves, the manna for the world. Now we come to that time every week when we gather together. We gather our hearts and we gather our prayers. Some I'll speak out loud that you have written today on Facebook and YouTube. 
Some you'll whisper in your own hearts at home, but we know that our loving God hears them all. First of all, I'd like to begin by asking for prayers for our pastor Marisa and her family over the death of her mother-in-law, Joan Ludwig. We pray for Joan and for her family at this difficult time of transition. May God give them courage. We pray also for Phoebe Wallace and her family after her death. We pray for Jean Frazier's family. Jean's service will be next Saturday. Also today, we want to pray for a black trans woman who was viciously murdered in Philadelphia. Um, her name was Dominique Remy Fells. We should name her. What many of us don't know is that the average age of survival of a black trans woman in this country is only 35. We pray for her and for all of our other trans siblings. We pray for our neighbor, D. We pray for Jerry and Peggy, who face major change. We pray for a member's father and for Patty when they're going through health issues. We pray for the 140 million poor people in the U.S. We pray for Dana and Grace. We ask for healing and peace in our broken world and that God give us the strength to be agents of healing and peace. And now I would like to offer prayers that come from three different places. One of them is the UCC Engaging Our Faith. I invite you to go to that website, Prayers for Justice and Peace. And one is from Reverend Dr. William J. Barber III, I'm sorry, the second of the Poor People's Campaign and the Red Letter Christians of the UK. Will you pray with me? May we know justice and compassion and repent for those who have let the viruses of greed and lives make a difficult situation worse. May those who have gone along with the lies just to please narcissism break free and tell the truth. May we who are merely inconvenienced remember those whose lives are at stake. May we who have no risk factors remember those most vulnerable. May we who have the luxury of working for home remember those who must choose between preserving their health or making their rent. May we who have the flexibility to care for our children when their schools close remember those who have no options. May we who have canceled our trips remember those who have no safe place to go. May we who are losing our margin money in atonement of the economic market Remember those who have no margin at all. May we who settle in for a quarantine at home remember those who have no home. As fear grips our country, let us choose love. During this time when we cannot physically put our arms around each other, let us find ways to be the loving embrace of God to our neighbors. Mm. For all of those who have fallen victim to hatred and inhumanity, for those loved ones who are left behind to mourn and for the souls of those whose hearts are cold. Lord, hear this prayer. For children who are being born into this world of conflict and violence, for women and mothers who suffer needlessly. Oh God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For those who have been forced into unemployment, who long to return to work, for those who struggle to support their families, for the soldiers who are misguided in thinking that their bullets will bring about peace, for those who feel called to conscientiously object, to those who are caught in the middle. Oh God, hear our prayer. For the children who cry in their beds at night and wonder, what have I done? For mothers and fathers who must try to explain the unexplainable, hear our prayer. For all the children who have died before their time, for the soldiers who have been forced to strip their humanity, for healers who are denied the opportunity to use their gifts. Oh Lord, hear our prayer. For the redemption of the souls of both victims and perpetrators, for those who commit themselves to the forgiveness of sin. And we close today, oh God, 
by praying for all of the fathers, for those who have reflected love and strength and generosity and wisdom and mercy as you have, for those whose love for us resemble your relationship with us. We also ask your blessings on those who served as father figures in our lives, maybe when our own biological fathers were not able to do so. May the love and selflessness they show be returned to them in all their relationships and help them know that their influence has changed us for the better. Oh God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And now would you please join me in the words that Jesus taught, the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, our Father who, who art, art in heaven, heaven hallowed be thy name. name. Thy, thy kingdom, kingdom come, come, thy, thy will, will be done, done on earth as, as it is in heaven. In heaven. Give us this, this day, day our, our daily, daily bread. bread. And forgive, and forgive us, us our sins, as, as we, we forgive, forgive those who sin against us. And lead, lead us, us not, not into temptation, temptation but, but deliver, deliver us from, from evil. evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the, and the glory forever, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. During this time of sheltering at home, we are inviting all of you to please continue to support the programs here at the church. Continue to reach out by sending checks or donating on Facebook, YouTube, or our webpage. We also remind you to please send in money for the Haiti Scholarship Fund Drive. It is not just our children that have great need. We also want to remind you that there are other ways you can give. Reach out, call, write a letter. Take an action, whether it has to be from in your own home or whether you feel bold enough and safe enough to be out in the world marching. But hold in prayer all of those who work so hard to try and make our world the place that Jesus told us it could be, to bring our kingdom here. We ask you to continue to give. Oh God, Pour out your blessings upon the gifts that we receive. Give us humble hearts and open hands. Help us to continue to use these gifts to better the lives of your children. We ask in the name of the Father and the Son and the Spirit, the Creator, the Christ, and the Spirit One. Amen. And now... Won't you please join us as we sing our doxology, our song of faith. Won't you join us in our closing hymn? It's Stand By Me, so why don't you stand up and sing along? When the storms of life are raging, Lord, stand by me. When the current pulls me under, Lord, stand by me. When the rising waters toss me like a ship upon the sea, you rule the wind and water, Lord, stand by me. In 
As we come to the close of our worship, I want to thank you for worshiping with us today. Just a reminder one last time that we are asking for you to give generously to the Haiti Scholarship Fund Drive. Please support a Haitian child in an education that can change her life and the future of her people. And now, hear this benediction as we get ready to go forth. I believe in God, the great sower, who weaves us together in community, collecting our loose ends and turning them into belonging. I believe in the Holy Spirit who hymns us in, before, and behind, catching us when we fall and writing us into God's holy narrative. And I believe in Jesus Christ who loved and claimed the people society had thrown out, refusing to disregard anyone as scrap. I believe that God has woven a part of God's own self into the fiber of our being, making us inherently worthy of love and of belonging. And I believe that the fabric of my life is weak, that I am prone to error and I need God's handiwork to remind me of love. I believe in the church and that like a quilt of different fabrics, she is designed to be as diverse and as beautiful as God's creation. And I believe that when life unravels, God is there to stitch my wounds together, to hold me in the palm of God's hand, and to tell me of love, and to invite me into a new journey. Amen. Amen. You're broken down and tired of living life on a merry-go-round. 